This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Elizabeth Dennehy, the daughter of legendary character actor Brian Dennehy, who you may remember from such classic films as First Blood, FX, Tommy Boy, Legal Eagles, uh, Blake Edwards, 10. He was in so many great movies. And Elizabeth has been a familiar face on television uh, going back to the 90s, or late 80s, I should say. She started out on the um, daytime soap opera Guiding Light, and she has been a guest star on such classic shows as Star Trek The Next Generation, Quantum Leap, Seinfeld. Um, she's been in such movies as Clear and, Pre- Pre- Clear and Present Danger, The Game, Prophecy 2, The Water Dance. And she has done so much great work, and we're going to talk about all of that stuff today. And I cannot wait. Also, I need to set the record straight. She was not in Total Recall. IMDb says she was, but she wasn't. I advertised that yesterday, and she saw it. And she was puzzled by that because she was not in uh, Total Recall. Her and um, Rosemary Dunsmore look very similar to each other. And so I uh, posted a picture of her in the movie with Arnold thinking that it was her. And and then now I think now that I think of it, I was like, no, Elizabeth Dennehy was not in Total Recall. So she was not in Total Recall. And also, rest in peace, Gary Rosington, Leonard Skinnerd. Well, they're officially gone now. We'll never see the likes of that amazing band again. The original members are all gone, and Gary was the last one. So, fly, free birds, fly. So yeah, here is my interview with Elizabeth Dennehy. Hey Elizabeth, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great, how are you? I am spectacular, and I can't tell you what a great honor this is. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, not at all. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. So, going back in time, I can imagine growing up the daughter of Brian Dennehy that uh, it was only natural that you would gravitate uh, toward acting as well. Yeah, it certainly uh, looked like a lot of fun, and it looks like um, a more interesting way to spend your life than in a cubicle behind a desk going to an office every day. Yeah, (laughs) it definitely was alluring. (laughs) Did he uh, encourage you? Not at all, and we didn't with our kids either. Uh, he definitely wanted us to have a more steady income, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of rejection in the business, so mm-hmm. you can go months and sometimes years between jobs, so it's really, really hard to keep your, your sanity and to keep yourself, uh, you know, ready to go when you do get a job. So he definitely did not want the instability and the financial insecurity that being in the business entails. Right. But did you get involved in school plays and all of that? Oh, yeah, of course, yes. My father was, um, before anybody knew who he was, he was an actor. He created a community theater in the town where we grew up. So every Mm -hmm. weekend was spent um, going to rehearsals because he would put us in the plays when they needed little kids. So it was a way of life with us. We, we when, Even when we were very little, we were the snow children in Carousel, and we were the no-neck monsters in Cat in a Hot Tin Roof, and it was just a way of life with us. So even though he wasn't getting paid as a professional actor, he was still always creating and always directing and, and acting in shows. So it was a way of life for us. And, of course, when we were in school, we automatically auditioned for shows and did shows. Uh, it, it just was, that was really normal. The way other families would have sports, you know, their dads would be fans of sports and go to sports. Mm-hmm. It would try out for teams. It was our team sport, being in shows and performing. Nice. So it was like a community theater company he had? Yeah, we grew up in um, Long Island, New York, in a town called Amityville. Yes, mm-hmm. the Amityville Horror House yeah. was there. And um, 
he created a, a community theater group called the Amityville Community Theater, or ACT. And so they put on shows at the high school, the Amityville High School. Nice, nice. I, I was reading that uh, you're a Shakespeare geek. Uh, what are some of your like favorite Shakespeare plays, if that's not too hard? Um, well, I have always loved The Winter's Tale. When I went to college, I was a theater major, and I went to Hofstra University on Long Island. Mm -hmm. And one of my very first jobs was uh, a stage assistant stage manager for A Winter's Tale. The Winter's Tale, uh, for a long, long time, was my favorite. Right now it's King Lear, but it was a wonderful production of um, of The Winter's Tale. And I was, of course, a freshman, so moony-eyed and green and fell in love with everybody in the cast, and they were all brilliant. And, but it was really, really a good production. I've seen that play a lot, and I'm like, Damn, you know, our college production of Winter's Tale was really smoking. Um, mm -hmm. So I love that play. But right now, I guess as I got older, I think because uh, King Lear is so much about aging, and it's bittersweet for me because my dad would have been brilliant as King Lear, and he never got the chance to do it. Uh, so I, I'm kind of a little bit obsessed with that play right now. Oh, uh, yeah, he would have been great uh, playing that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm a Romeo and Juliet kind of a guy. Um, it's a it, great play. Yeah, not only has it been done so many times, but so many people have done stories like it, you know, like West Side Story is a Romeo and Juliet story. Exactly. Yeah, it's so wonderful. So after high school, you attend Hofstra. So uh, did any of your uh, classmates there go on to become successful in acting? At Hofstra? Um mm -hmm. Um, I, I, do you know Phil Rosenthal? He created Everybody Loves Raymond. Oh. He has a show called uh, Somebody Feeds Phil. He travels around the world. Of course, I know the name. Yeah, so he and I went to college together, and his wife, Monica Horan, is one of my best friends. And uh, she was also on Everybody Loves Raymond. She put Amy, um, married to Ray's brother. So they, nice. they're probably the most famous people that I went to college with, but Margaret Colin is a highly esteemed, prestigious actress who works all the time, mm -hmm. and Tom McGowan is also works all the time, and uh, Margaret Colin actually played Hermione in The Winter's Tale, I was talking about, and also John Hoffman, he kind of was younger mm -hmm. than me, but he is the producer and creator of Only Murders in the Building, mm -hmm. lots of other shows like Frankie and Gracie. So there's a bunch of us that are still still at it, still working. Before um, I got to Hofstra, there's an actor called Peter Friedman who's on Succession, mm -hmm. and he was a Hofstra alum. Our probably our most famous Hofstra alum, well Francis Ford Coppola, of course, mm -hmm. and but also Madeline Kahn. So oh yeah, also know Billy Crystal and Christopher Walken went there too. Oh, did they? Yeah. In fact. I Billy Crystal did one of his HBO specials at Hofstra University. Oh, I think I dimly remember that. Yeah, that's, that's, I think I remember reading that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So Hofstra does have uh, a history of um, people uh, uh, going from there to the big time. Yeah. So then you attended uh, the, the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts. How about any classmates there? Well, I, um, I graduated from Hofstra, and I felt, didn't feel quite ready to go out into the, into the world, so I did a one-year program um, in London, and I, one of my classmates is Rita Wilson, who's married to Tom Hanks. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's, there's a woman, there was an actress there, a British actress at the time, Sally Dexter, who went on to do big things, mm -hmm. and James Bundy, who was an American student, but he was in the three-year program, he is the head of Yale School of Drama. That's a big deal. So mm -hmm. um, before I got there, there was an actor called Joko Ivanek who um, has done very well for himself. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I was there long before Benedict Cumberbatch and... You know, uh, Brian Cox is a Lambda graduate, so he's on the board and a big um, 
a big rabble rouser for Lambda. Mm -hmm. Was Jeanette Goldstein there? Jeanette Goldstein was not there when I was there, but she was in Titanic with my husband. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Rico, and speaking of Jeanette Goldstein, mm -hmm. I was at Lambda with Rico Ross, who was in Aliens with Jeanette. Oh, a <laughs> small world, yeah. It is, a, it is a small world. It's amazing how we all know each other. And, like, name and name, I can probably figure out how I'm connected to them in some way. I may not know them, but I know people who know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows them. Yeah, there, were, there was no internet back then. It was such a smaller world. Everybody knew each other. Exactly. So where are you? You're in... In, you're in California. Yeah, uh, currently I'm living in Redding, but I'm from San Francisco. I love San Francisco. Yeah, San Francisco is at its best. It's, it's the greatest. I, I, I love that place. Um, after um, you graduated, you went uh, back to New York? After I graduated from Lambda, I went back to New York, lived at home for a bit. Mm -hmm. I... Um, I started auditioning, pounding the pavement, and got cast in the New York Shakespeare Festival, a production of uh, Henry V with Kevin Kline and Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. Um, so I was like, off and away, you know, this is the way it's going to be, and started making commercials, started making money, and started by living as an actor. So basically from like, 1985, um, mm -hmm. I didn't have to have, thank God, a, a day job pretty much since then. I mean, I was a waitress like everybody else is. And then when mm -hmm. um, got in the New York Shakespeare Festival, that was kind of it. I was working, I was working with Kevin. Very good to me. I was working with Kevin Klein in that play. Wonderful. He was great. He was really... The funny thing about Kevin Klein mm -hmm. is at the time he was, you know, really young, handsome. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it was maybe before Sophie's Choice or maybe after, I can't remember, but around those days when he was just really young yeah. and handsome. He has leading man looks, but he's actually a character actor. Right. He's much more interested in the comic kind of parts and outsider parts that he had these leading men looks, you know, so mm -hmm. that was, he was always drawn to big, broad comedies. He's a very good clown, in other words. He's a great, funny, funny clown, but he's, you know, cursed with being handsome, so mm -hmm. he sort of kind of grew into himself as he got older. Yeah, he comes from that tradition of guys like John Lithgow, you know, of character actors, you know, who could, who could also play leads. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so, yeah, he was he was lovely. Um, he sneered at uh, me being from Lambda because he was a Juilliard person. So he he would tease me and and look pretend to look down his nose when I wore my Lambda sweatshirt. But it was pretty yeah. funny. <laughs> so then uh, you you got to be on the the Guiding Light for a season. I was on the Guiding Light for a year. Yes, mm -hmm. and that was really really hard. I had to learn like 40 pages yeah. of dialogue a day, but I, I'm thankful for that job because it taught me two things. It taught me how to learn lines really quickly, but I, I, it, I still have a, a remarkable facility for that. I can, I can uh, it's, it annoys my husband because I'll be running lines with him for an audition mm -hmm. and he's really struggling and he's looking at me, he goes, you're not even turning the pages. And I'm like, yeah, I haven't memorized. Like, it's annoying. It's actually annoying that I can learn lines very quickly. Um, and it also taught me to be, be still, because when you come from the theater, you're used to, I feel like I should move here. Yeah. But on a soap opera, You, if you move, they have to relight everything. They have to move the cameras. Mm -hmm. You have to actually stand still. And the cameras change. They're looking at him. They're looking at me. They're looking at him. Camera one is on me. Camera two is on him. The cameras do all the movement, so you have to stay very still. Mm -hmm. And for a theater actor, it was really hard for me. So I would, like, press my leg against the couch to glue myself in place. But I learned stillness and how to be very, very still, if that makes any sense. It, it does make sense, yeah. I mean, actors have told me that um, soap operas are the hardest job in acting because you, me you memorize all those pages of dialogue a day and you can't stop or mess up, otherwise they'll fire you. 
Leah yeah, Bear, they have to they have to start all over again if you mess up and they just don't have the time. Um, the other reason soap operas are hard is the writing is so bad. Yeah. The writing is just, just so, I mean, think about how long it takes to make a good feature film. Yeah. Years. Because you're writing the script for years, mm -hmm. then you're assembling the team for years. Right. You shoot, if it's going to be any good, like nine months, ten months, then you spend another year editing, adding the music. Soap operas are churning stuff out at, at an hour a day. Right. No time to make it as good as the feature film. When I watch soap operas and I see, you can hear the feet shuffling and your people are half in shadow. I mean, I haven't watched a soap opera in, in a really long time, but it's really hard to make it good quality uh, when you're churning it out an hour a day. So mm -hmm. um, when I can remember getting very, very frustrated, I'd work so hard on scenes and then I'd watch I'd watch the, the results, and it was like, oh, God, I worked so hard on that, and you can't even, you can't even see the work I did. So yeah. um, that, that can be very, very frustrating. You know, I was doing all this stuff, and they weren't even on me, you know, or mm -hmm. they edited it down to fit in between the commercials. And the thing about soap operas is the afternoon TV is watching commercials. The soap opera scenes interrupt the commercials. That's why they're called soap operas right they're there to get you to watch the commercials and to buy the soap right and of course they come from uh the soap operas come from uh old radio you know and so yeah. They're, yeah. they're kind of still working in that medium it would be better if they were like on once a week like tv shows you know where you could spend yeah seven or eight days creating something of quality but churning out an hour a day i mean it is it's really hard it's really hard to not get frustrated. I found it. It is, and I'm surprised the medium is still going. <laughs> I know, but people are devoted to their stories. They love them. Mm -hmm. Next Cub, Star Trek Next Generation, was that a standard audition for you? Yep. I, I was 28 when I worked on that show. I had an agent in L.A., and I went to just another audition. And I am kind of sheepish about this. I was not a fan of Star Trek, never watched the original show, yeah. not a sci-fi person at all. And I go to conventions all the time, and the fans are so... Devoted. ...with me, that because they're like, what did you watch? What are you a fan of? When I was growing up, I was really into the Six Rhymes of Henry VIII, Brides Had Revisited... <laughs> Uh, upstairs, downstairs, I was an Anglophile. That was what brought my world. Merchant Ivory films, mm -hmm. I not start a sci-fi just didn't appeal to me at all. Um, and I'm sorry, but it just didn't. So I, I, I didn't know who Riker was. I, I was like, oh, you're Riker? I thought it was the Baldy guy. I just was <laughs> completely ignorant uh, of the world, and it was just another audition. And I went in and tried to make it sound like the way humans speak. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I was really surprised that I got it. I'm delighted that I got it. Yeah. And were, were you going to be a regular character at one point or just a couple episode arc? I was just hired for the two episodes. That's all I ever was told. So. Mm -hmm. Did you get to work with Whoopi? No, she was. She and I weren't in any scenes together. As a matter of fact, I don't even think we were on the same day, so I didn't even see her there. I see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the con the conventions now are so huge, and all, all you had to do was do one or two one one or two episodes, and you get invited to a Star Trek convention now. Well, Jonathan Frakes um, said to me on the set. Mm-hmm. He was, first of all, he had worked with my dad, and so he was very, very kind and took me under his wing, and mm -hmm. he said, you have absolutely no idea what's going to happen to you, and I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I had no clue. I didn't know anything. This is back, again, before computers. I mean, I think there was an internet, but I certainly didn't have one, so yeah. I knew nothing about the fan base, knew nothing about the conventions and, and stuff like that. I mean, I knew that there were Star Trek conventions, of course, but I didn't, never did I think that um, 
that the character would uh, would be so in- interesting to people. And like you said, if you're on it in any capacity, you're of interest to the people. So my, my very first convention was, uh, I'll never forget, it was St. Louis, Missouri. Mm-hmm. And it was in May. And I remember that because it was around about Mother's Day. And I'd never been in a more humid place in my life. I thought I was going to, I thought my lungs were going to collapse. And I'm from New York. Yeah. <laughs> where we know, we know humidity. That was, that Mississippi River, um, that humidity was like, that took the cake. Um, and I was really, really nervous. I thought because... I was not a Star Trek fan. People were going to think I was an imposter and I had no right to be there because uh, I didn't watch the show. And people could not have been more lovely. They were really charming and lovely and nice. And George Takai was amazing, so sweet. I was so blown away by the the devotion of the fans. There was one guy Mm. who showed up, you know, of course he's wearing full-on Star Trek costume. And yeah. he had a stack of about 20 D, uh, VHS tapes wow. of every movie that George was in for him to sign. I uh, couldn't believe my eyes. Crazy. I couldn't believe it. It was, it was like, that's fortitude, man. That is devotion. That is. <laughs> I, I, it, was, I, it was eye-opening, to say the least. Uh, so that was my first convention. Um, and I guess... The, um, it probably was after both parts aired, because remember, there would have been about a three-month gap. The first part was the end of one season, and then part two was the start of the next season. Right. So I'm imagining the conventions were started happening after both had aired. And it was the first time anybody had ever done a cliffhanger on the show, and it was the first time Riker's authority was questioned. So mm. that's why it was such a big deal and why people, you know, wanted to um, meet me and yell at me and tell me what a bitch I was. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's been interesting. I will say this. I've been doing conventions now for, well, I was 28 then. Mm-hmm. And so for 30 years. And it's changed so much. I don't know if you go to conventions, but oh, I do. <laughs> when, I first, when I first started, it was sort of a thing that nerds did. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Oh, like, yeah. People were considered kind of nerds. And then I think San Diego's Comic Con sort of changed everything. It became a cool thing to do. Mm-hmm. And cool kids go. Now, like, when you have J.J. Abrams going to Comic Con to support Star Wars, those mm-hmm. movies... Um, and the cosplay, now all of a sudden you see cool, hip, young people doing cosplay and uh, dressing up. And it's not, like, just relegated to the nerd contingent. Do you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I started going to con seven years ago, so I'm a little late in the game. But people told me, you know, before that, cons were... Um, they were a little bit smaller, you know, I mean, of course, devoted people went to them, but, like, celebrities didn't charge for autographs then, and there was a little bit less egos involved in the convention scene, you know, but uh, from what I've seen of it, you know, I, I, there's a lot of it I like, I have to say. Well, I mean, I, I just recently worked with Michael Rooker, and he goes mm-hmm. to conventions, and if you want a Michael Rooker to come to your convention, mm-hmm. you're going to have to pay him serious money. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, he and uh, all the people from The Walking Dead, they're very busy actors, so if they're going to fly 12 hours to Germany or 12 hours to Europe, you know, then money has to be, has to be an offer that very difficult to refuse. Yeah, funny thing is too, you know, back in the day, a lot of conventions were sponsored by, let's say, like Fangoria magazine, the horror uh, magazine. Oh, you know, uh-huh. They had their they had their convention, right? Nowadays, most conventions are like sponsored by like you know people with a lot of money who you know knows that you know um you know horror or sci-fi or whatever is hot you know and so they're they're like offered to like make an investment now you know it's it's very interesting this this era of conventions yeah yeah i i think i hope that 
people are making an effort so that you don't have to be rich to go to them, you know, that they oh. have different uh, cost plans because um, I, I know myself and all, all the other actors I know who go to them want the average fan to be able to participate. And if they're charging, you know, for this, that, and the other, it's uh, a little prohibitive. I, well, I'll tell you, I, I know a lot of people who can't go to them because because conventions are so expensive now, you know, and meeting people that they love is so expensive, you know. It, it's really yeah. hard. I mean, people, they save up for a good year before they go to them now, which is which is really sad, you know. Right, I know. I know, I just looked online for Bruce Springsteen tickets. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I have always wanted to see him live, but he is really expensive to go see. I've seen him a bunch of times, so I'm good. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, used, it didn't used to be that way. I, I Ticketmaster, oh, my God, don't get me started. I know, Kiss. So anyway, um, yeah, yeah, so the, the, the conventions and people, you know, just, it's very moving that people still care about work that you've done 30 years ago. I can't. You know, my husband um, was in the movie Gettysburg, and he's going oh, yeah. to Gettysburg at the end of March, I think, for a uh, gathering to celebrate, to commemorate the um, anniversary of that movie. And mm -hmm. But other than that, like, I, I can't think of another genre that has such a devoted fan base. I know uh, horror and sci-fi too are are the are the probably the most devoted and maybe superheroes even though superheroes is kind of sci-fi but not really but those okay yeah, the, yeah those are probably the most you know the Marvel universe as they call it now then um, comes uh, let's see the Water Dance do you remember anything about that movie? It was my very first feature film. Mm -hmm. Um. I am just trying to remember. Eric Stoltz was in it, and he was very nice. And I was very impressed that um, the filmmaker was a handicapped, wheelchair-bound man, mm -hmm. and he wanted to tell his story. And that was, it was a beautiful film. Um, uh, God, it was so long ago. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, Wesley Snipes was in it, and he was really cool. I can't remember really much more. Helen um, Hunt. I remember something that was very, very sweet about that film. It was my very first film, and I was a physical therapist, and I had a couple of lines here and there. Mm -hmm. But um, before the premiere, which we were all invited to, mm -hmm. Neil Yemen is the director, who's sadly no longer with us. He called me at home mm -hmm. to tell me that I... Um, he really loved what I did, but unfortunately for time and for all the other reasons, there was less of me in the film that I might be expecting. And I thought that was very decent of him to warn me, mm -hmm. you know, to say that they, you know, um, they had to cut some things for time or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, and actually when I went, I remember thinking, oh, there's more of me than I thought after yeah. his phone call. So it was very, that was very gallant of him to do that. Yeah, I, I just remember Helen Hunt and Eric Stoltz, uh, they get caught having a conjugal visit in the hospital, and it was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, God, I haven't watched that in a long, long time. Um, but yeah, I remember it was very well received, had a great cast um, mm -hmm. of really good actors. Yeah, the, that was, um, I was proud to be a part of that. How was uh, guest starring on Quantum Leap? Oh my gosh, these are such ancient history. Um, that was, that was um, because Scott Bakula was actually directing that episode. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't remember if, he, if he'd done that before. It might have been his first time. But in the, we, we were playing um, people who were being held hostage in a bank holdup. And I was playing a pregnant woman. And I, so, of course, I had this gigantic, fake, pregnant prosthesis on. But there, here's, a, here's a little known fact about me. Well, I don't care. I was a smoker at the time. Uh -huh. I remember on the lot, you know, during breaks and something, I would go outside and have a cigarette. Yeah. And I got such dirty looks and people pointing at me. And I was like, oh, my God, what is going on? I realized because I looked like I was about to give birth any second and yeah. people didn't know that it was fake 
Uh, the, the, so they were giving you the stink eye? They were giving me the stink eye seeing this person who was about to give birth any second inhaling a cigarette. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 had, I eventually stopped smoking on the, on the set of that movie because I was getting sick and tired of getting dirty looks. I remember that. Um, I remember I worked with Dwyer Brown, mm-hmm. who um, was a big, uh, had a big part in Field of Dreams. Mm-hmm. He was like, that was a big deal that he was in that show. Um, you know, because he, it was like, oh my God, Dwyer Brown from Field of Dreams. I don't know if you remember Field of Dreams, but he was um, uh, the dad in that. Yeah. And I, so that was Dwyer Brown was in that, and um, I made friends that I still stay in touch with. I mean, like through Facebook, but Kelly Overby, and uh, there was a there was a I don't know if you know the movie director Dennis Dugan. Oh yeah. Um, his parents were in that movie. They were the old people in Quantum Leap. Mm-hmm. And I stayed in touch with Marion and Charles Dugan. I'm sure they were old then. I'm sure yeah. they, they are no longer with us. But I stayed in touch with them. Like, we, I would send Christmas cards, and they came to see me in plays when I was in plays. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how you can become, you know, friends with people on sets like that. It's really lovely. You become a little family. Oh, yeah. Sometimes you stay in touch. And that's, I'm so grateful for Facebook because otherwise, um, you know, I would lose touch with everybody I worked with. So it's kind of great. Yeah. I'm sure. I I remember from that one, um, Mm -hmm. the the smoking was a funny story. And, oh, Charles and Marion Dugan, who were in their 80s or late 70s at the time, they celebrated their wedding anniversary uh, while we were on the set. And Scott Bakula brought them in an anniversary cake, a congratulations cake. So, a lovely, lovely set. Nice, nice. I, I'm sure a lot of people remember you from Seinfeld. Yes, yes, I get uh, the Drake at all the time. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> people, I hate the Drake. People will say that to me. And uh, that, that, was, that was a funny job uh, because it was... I've been on a lot of TV shows where they... You already know that they're canceled, like it was just not working out. Like Brooklyn Bridge, they had already been canceled when I did that show. And everybody's sullen and sad and not very talkative or, or you know, communicative. But Seinfeld, when I did Seinfeld, mm-hmm. they had that week broken the top five. Mm-hmm. So it was just when, because I don't know if you know this, but Seinfeld was on for like, three years before it really took hold. Oh, oh, yeah. It was a slow burn. Nowadays, they don't give shows the chance. They don't give ch- shows much of a chance to take hold. If you don't latch on, like, the first season, you're toast. Um, and it had finally, finally cracked the top five. So everybody was so excited and so happy. Um, and... Uh, there was a moment in that I had to record a phone message like, hi, this is, um, you know, it, I had to record my outgoing message. Mm-hmm. And Larry David was there and I had all my family was there in the audience. And he was like, okay, say this. And then, so I'm recording the message. And I said, he goes, in front of everybody, yeah, no, that's not funny. Say this. And I was like, oh, I'm not funny. You know, like, <laughs> it was really hard to not take that personally. That was my funny memory from that. <laughs> My friend uh, was a stand-in on Seinfeld, Peggy Lane O'Rourke. Uh-huh. Yeah, I adore her. Um, Rick Overton, I know him a little from stand-up comedy. He's a great guy. I'm trying to get him on here. He was great to work with, huh? Yeah, very, very funny. Always on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, like, like, a t- like typical comics, they're just always on. Um, yeah, he's really, he's a very smart, smart guy, smart comic. You, you, you looked very pretty in this episode, the way you had the, the makeup and the hair done and stuff. Was, was, was that like, you know, specifically pre-planned? Um, my hair was darker than, you know, I I went through a stage where I was always changing my hair color and it was straight. I have very, I have curly hair, I have naturally curly hair, and for some reason they straightened it. I don't, I don't remember why. I don't remember. Um, it's probably, when you have curly hair, it's very hard to make it look the same day mm-hmm. in and day out, and uh, I have very problematic hair. And so they probably straightened it so they could 
duplicate that look and make it look exactly the same every day. Yeah. You played a uh, reporter in Clear and Present Danger. Any Anything memorable about that experience? That's a funny story. <laughs> Donald Moffat was the president in that right. episode. And I was, like, reporter number three in the press pool. Mm -hmm. And Donald Moffat had done a play with my father. My dad did Iceman Comet, mm -hmm. Eugene O'Neill's Iceman Comet. Um... In New York? Was it in New York or was it in Chicago? Um, maybe it was in Chicago and it moved to New York. I can't remember. And I went up to Donald Moffat and I said, Hi, um, nice to meet you. My dad is Brian Dennehy. And he went, Oh, and we, still, we had lunch together and we chatted. And he, he was absolutely lovely. And then we get on the set. And uh, remember... This is like just starting out in the biz. Yeah. And, you know, I have one line. And the line was like, um, Ms. President, Mr. President, do you remember the first time you realized this was a problem? And when we were shooting and I was on camera, I said, Mr. President, Mr. President, he called on me. And he said, I said, Mr. President, do you remember the first time this became a problem? And Donald Moffat put his hand to his ear like he didn't hear me. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, well, I have to repeat the question. So I repeated the question, and he mm -hmm. did that every single time we shot the scene. And then on a break, he said to me, I'm trying to beef up your part a little bit. <laughs> Isn't that the sweetest thing? Yeah. He was trying to give me more screen time. Very, very funny, very sweet. Oh, that is sweet, yeah. <laughs> You got to be uh, on a two-parter of the series. Most people don't remember, but I remember it well. It's called The Lazarus Man with uh, Robert Urich. Yeah. Is there anything you remember yeah. from that episode? That was my fav most favorite job um, for a long time. That was, mm -hmm. uh, we shot in Santa Fe. Yeah. And my uh, father had a house in Santa Fe, so I took the hotel, you know, the per diem, but stayed at my dad's house. I had my father's house all to myself. My father did the movie Silverado right. and fell in love with Santa Fe and bought a house there. So that was great. I had this big, beautiful house to stay in, mm -hmm. and Robert Yurick was just lovely. I loved working with him. I've been thinking a lot about Lazarus Man because I had to actually um, wield a gun. And, you yeah. know, with this whole horrible story about the cinematographer, Helena, being shot. Yeah. Remembering the, how careful they were handing me the firearm. Like, everything stops on a set. They open the barrel. They show you that there's, you know, it's clear. And just trying to figure out, you know, how that could have gone so wrong. Um, I loved Lazarus Man. I loved being in Santa Fe. I loved the director. I loved Robert Urich. I loved my clothes. I loved my wigs. <laughs> Just everything about it. When I left, when I when the job was over, I was literally crying uh, on, on the plane coming home. Because here's the thing. I don't think people realize when you're an actor, especially if you're not like a name yet, mm -hmm. I didn't know when was the next time I was going to have a job that fulfilling that mm -hmm. fun. Do you, you know what I mean? Like, it yeah. could be a long time before I get asked to be... I, I never, ever had, up until that point, the experience of going to a fitting and seeing all these amazing period costumes and these dresses, and I said, okay, which one do you want me to wear? Which one do you want me to put on first? And mm -hmm. then saying, which one do you want to put on first? That has never happened to me before. That's leading lady treatment. Yeah. You know? And it's like, oh, my gosh, they're asking me what I want. They're asking me what I want to wear. That, that it, was, it was like flying first class for the first time. Like, mm -hmm. wow, this is the way it's supposed to be. Really, really cool. So um, I just actually worked on another Western, which is another reason why Lazarus Man is has been on my mind. I'm in the, um, I don't know if you've heard of this movie, Horizon, written, directed, and starring Kevin Costner. Oh, yeah. That, um, I, I just did uh, uh, part one, and then I'm going back to do 
movie. I'm in movie one, two, and four, and I'll be going back uh, soon to do movie two. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, westerns are a lot of fun from what I've been told. You get to ride horses all day and just, you know, live in this fantasy world that harkens back to childhood. So much fun. So much fun. Um, and in Horizon, not only do I have a hoop skirt and a camisole and a, a, a corset, but I'm playing an Irish woman, so I speak with an Irish accent and I have a wig. And Michael Rooker plays my husband. That's why I, I mentioned him earlier. Um, and Kevin Costner is just a, a dream. To be directed by an actor is such a treat because he knows exactly what actors need to hear in order to get ready for the scene. Um, mm. I had some emotional things, and he was just very, very helpful, really great. Uh, the whole time I was there in Utah filming this, I just was pinching myself. I couldn't believe how lucky I am to be there. So you, I keep thinking back to Lazarus, Lazarus Men and thinking Westerns are the best. They're just so, so much fun. How about the the game with Michael Douglas and Sean Penn? Oh, God, that was a funny story because I was newly pregnant. Mm -hmm. I got pregnant and then I got cast and I was like, oh, my God. Because remember how I talked about how sometimes it can take nine months to make a movie? Mm -hmm. Yep. And my character was in the beginning and towards the end. I was like, uh, this is going to be interesting. So when I went for my wardrobe fitting, I told... I was playing Michael Douglas's executive secretary, and I said to the customer, um, you might want to get my costumes in a bunch of different sizes. <laughs> and they were cool. They were totally fine. Um, funnily enough, we shot the last scene of that movie first. Mm -hmm. So the, first, the, the, the last scene of the movie is a big party scene where somebody falls through the glass skylight yeah. in a ballroom and that was the first scene we shot and I was just newly pregnant flew up to um, San Francisco yep and I remember so back in like the 90s people still smoked a lot yeah and I remember I was they had me sharing a room oh god I wish I could remember her name Linda she just died. She was in the movie. Let me look her up here. That was, what's that movie with um, Brooke Adams? Oh, she was in that Western. Is it Heaven's Gate? Maybe. Yeah, yeah. She she was in the game, and she is, was a chain smoker. And I was like, you cannot smoke in this room. I'm just newly pregnant. And she did not like that at all. She never hung out in the room. I guess she hung out in the bar. <laughs> but I was like, I was every, it wasn't even so much that endangering my child, which was enough reason, but the smell made me sick. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the game was uh, Michael, oh, Michael Douglas. I have a great story about Michael Douglas. Okay. We opened the, we opened the movie. With me going in there and giving him, running down the invitations. You got the, the sweating, and he was like, pass, skip. And every time we did the scene, he would ask the script supervisor, how long was that? And every time we cut time off of it, mm -hmm. he would high five me. And I thought, this is what it's like to work with an actor who's also a producer. And so getting that scene as quickly as possible and so that we are like a machine, like we run through this routine every day and we know how long we can talk. You know what I, do you know what I mean? Like we yeah. just fit together like a well-oiled machine. Um, that was so important to him that we run through this routine every morning and it looks like we have this long relationship, long-standing relationship. Uh, and you know, he's a team player. He's just like really into over overlooking the whole of the film rather than just his part being good. Oh yeah, well he produces, so he's got that instinct. Exactly, exactly. And I, I was very impressed by him working with him. And he, you know, I was prepared to all be intimidated and to be like, oh, Mr. Douglas, but he looked me right in the eye and he was like, let's go, let's do this, and really, really great. I have never seen of fancier craft services in my life. They had an entire deli counter. They had an entire sushi counter. It was really fancy. 
but you know, it's funny how when you sometimes, when the first time you see that four star treatment, what an impact it makes on you, like being able to choose the clothes I wanted for Lazarus Man, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. and seeing like really, really fancy uh, craft service when, you know, you're used to bagels <laughs> yeah. and donuts. Uh, the prophecy too with Christopher Walken. I was with my scene was with Jennifer Beale. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember much about that honestly. I remember really bad craft service. Uh, <laughs> um, I remember being in the chair. I Walken, The Deer Hunter was a movie that. I, um, when it was over, I couldn't move for like 20 minutes. It yeah. really had a huge impact on me. And I was really, really hoping I was going to get to see him or meet him, but I didn't. And I remember um, asking the makeup people, you know, you hear all these stories. Everybody always thinks he's really weird. Mm-hmm. I don't know why he has this reputation. And I, so I said, you know, what's he like? And they were like, he is the most charming, delightful happy-go-lucky guy, health nut, jogs every day. Yeah. So surprising to hear that, but I, 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 I'm sadly, I didn't get to meet him. I wish I, wish I had. Um, you played a parent in Come On, Get Happy, the Partridge Family Story. Uh, do you remember anything about that? I re- I'm still really good friends with Eve Gordon, who played um, Shirley Jones mm-hmm. and Shirley Partridge in that. And I remember I would watch... This doesn't happen very often. I would watch, if I was on the set and she was acting, I would stand off and watch her because she channeled Shirley Jones. It Mm -hmm. was an absolute magic trick to watch how she not only played Shirley Jones, she's playing two people, playing Shirley Jones, playing Shirley Partridge. It was incredible. That was an amazingly impressive beat. Really, really cool. Um, yeah. he's so talented and we're, we're still friends. We see each other, uh, in town. We, I go to the theater a lot and so does she, and we often run into, into each other. She's a love, a real sweetheart. Yeah. Um, other than that, um, it's so funny though, to be playing the, I was the first Chris's mother. Mm-hmm. Um, and I rem- I was, my first crush was David Cassidy. So I yeah. was so totally into the Partridge family and, um, it was just it was just really, really funny to be taking part in a part of like cultural lore that I was so, you know, into growing up. Uh, I'm a huge Partridge Family fan. I got the entire series on DVD for Christmas this past year. Oh, that's so sweet. That's a great gift. Yeah. I, I, I never saw this, but it's, there's a great cast. It, um, Hard Time Hostage Hotel. It was Burt Reynolds' last oh movie God. with Hal Needham. <laughs> Oh my God, that that movie! I um, I mean, it was the craziest set I have ever been on in my life. Amazing cast: Keith Carradine, and first of all, something that had never happened to me before. Straight offer. I didn't audition for it. They saw my reel, and mm-hmm. I just got a, a, offered it. And it was like that has never happened before or since. Hal Needham, the director, he directed all the Smokey and the Bandit movies, and this is what, I've never experienced this before. We were never, so I, if I had to see Keith Carradine kidnaps me. Yeah. And um, um, I can't think of the guy who plays, David Rashi is my husband. David Rashi, yeah. Rashi, yeah. I think they say Rashi. Rashi? Rashi? Anyway. I think it's Rashi. Um, so we had these scenes main Keith Carradine sitting in the director's chair waiting to be called in and the director would call in Keith Carradine. Mm -hmm. Then Keith would come out, sit down, and then he would call me in. We never, ever acted together. Hal Needham would read the lines, the camera's on me, and he'd go, now, Keith Carradine comes over and he slaps you across the face and you react. And it was like, but we never did the scene, the actors together. Yeah. (laughs) He doesn't shoot a master. He doesn't shoot a master with everybody together. He only shoots coverage, and the other actor is not there giving you the eye line or feeding you the lines. It's the director, Hal Needham. Mm-hmm. It was the craziest thing I've ever worked on in my life. I've never had that experience before or since. 
and uh, Deborah Christ- Christopher played um, your um, your aide in that. Deborah, Deborah Christ- Christopherson. Christopherson, yes, I had her on the show. She's very interesting, and every day on Facebook, she's posting a meme that has an old saying or credo on it. <laughs> Yep, yep, she was lovely. We had a great time uh, working together, but it was just so bizarre. And then also Spencer Garrett, who's a friend of mine now, he's in that movie, and um, I remember watching it, and there was um, us running away, like we escaped from the um, the kidnapper, and endless, constant footage of us running through the halls. I think the movie came in under time, so they just kept adding in more of us running through the halls. Like, it just felt like it was going on forever. It was just a wackadoodle film. Wackadoodle. But (laughs) here's the other great thing. Mm -hmm. I got to work with the amazing Charles Durning. My favorite, favorite movie of all time. I have, like, five favorite films. And one of them has always been Dog Day Afternoon. I literally kneeled down at his feet and said, okay, Dog Day Afternoon, tell me everything. Yeah. So, and I think he probably has that happen to him a lot because he just sort of like went on and started telling stories. Like yeah. it felt like he was expecting it or he knew exactly what I was, what I meant because um, he just took it away. It's an iconic film. You know? <laughs> oh, I love that movie so much. You know, just like what was improvised, what was scripted. Did you know this? Did you know that? I wanted to know everything. <laughs> Red Dragon. Which I have never seen because I can't, I'm very, very squeamish. I can't take violent movies yeah. at all in any form. So when I went to the table read, uh, that was as much, that was good enough for me. That was all I needed. We read the script out loud and I was like, yeah, I'm not, I don't need to see this. Um, another really funny story about that movie Mm-hmm. Um, there's the director. Google him. I'm just not going to even say anything, but... I know who it is. Yeah. Okay, so I have a scene where I play a forensic pathologist, and I find a piece of evidence that makes Harvey Keitel and Ed Norton go, we got him. So, uh, um, a, a, you know, but you read, I'm only reading sides. I did the table read and then I come in and you're used to getting in, getting out, mm-hmm. not taking any more time, not making a fuss, know your lines, don't bump into the furniture. And mm-hmm. Ed Norton, this is another example of an actor who's thinking about the whole film, mm-hmm. like Michael Douglas, not thinking just about how do I look? What's my part like? He's thinking about the whole film. So when I was doing the scene, not Brett Ratner, not the director, but Ed Norton said, okay, in this part, you find this fiber on this tissue, and we're standing there while you're looking. So you need to go slowly looking, scouring this thing. The longer it takes, the more impatient and the more... Uh, anxious, me and Harvey have to become, and the audience should be coming like, come on, find it, find it, time is wasting, time is wasting. And then you find it, and then very, very carefully, you have to painstakingly pick it up with the tweezers, put it in the envelope, and give it to us, and then we fly. Mm -hmm. So he was using me as a partner to help jack up the suspense and ratchet up the urgency and how life and death the situation was. And I just was so impressed that an, an actor who's a star could understand. He totally saw where I was as a day player or a guest star, which is like, just get in, get out, and don't cause any fuss, don't rock the boat, don't, you know, don't draw any attention to yourself. And he understood exactly where I was coming from. And instead of saying, all right, we'll make the best of it, he brought me on board and treated me like a team member. Nice. I was very, very impressed by by him doing that. Nice. Did you like guest starring on Charmed and recurring on there? (laughs) Charmed is so funny because uh, the wind, the girls were lovely, and I would just stare at Rose McGowan like, how could a human being be this flawless? Um, Really lovely, lovely women. Everybody was great. But the funny thing about Charmed is. so the sci-fi stuff has been Star Trek, mm-hmm. Galaxy Quest, Quantum Leap, Quantum Leap, Quantum, Quantum Leap. Um, as Charmed, I was cast as an 
elder in the white robes and I'm, you know, on the set. I'm like, okay, so what is an elder? Oh, you're all knowing. You're an all knowing omniscient, omniscient, um, uh, omnipotent, omnipotent. Oh my God, I can't speak. Um, omnipotent. Forget it. All knowing, <laughs> all seeing wisdom, the font of wisdom. Yeah. Omnipotent. All knowing. You, you even did a movie with your dad called Welcome to Paradise. Oh, yeah. Do you want to hear my charm story? Of course. Oh, I thought you were finished. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, so he, I'm this all-knowing being, and I said to them, I said, why am I asking so many questions if I know everything? Mm-hmm. And, and I said, if I'm all-knowing, all I do is ask them questions. Anything, and they were like, "We don't ask questions like that on this set." Right. So the difference between that show and a Gene Roddenberry show, where all of the stuff in Star Trek could actually be possible, it's actually really thought through scientifically and makes kind of makes sense. Okay, welcome to paradise. Yeah. You. The third film with my dad. Mm hmm. Right. Um. It was fun working with him. I played his daughter. Right. Um, can't remember that much about it. It was freezing cold. Um, it was fun. Yeah, it was. It was. It was kind of a sweet little movie. I got to work with Brad Stein, who was really fun. He played my husband. Um, and yeah, I can't remember that much. Nothing really stands out about it. I hated my clothes. Yeah. Hey, I had really hokey clothes. Hated my hair. Um, very distracted. But you know, when you when, mm -hmm. but it was clothes that my character would wear. But I just hated the way I looked in them. You know, just sort yeah. of like conservative Christian buttoned up. Um, you know, just just not not very flattering. Me but it was the right. For, it was right for the character. And a couple of people I've talked to were in it, uh, Marianne Mueller-Lai and um, Connie Ray, great ladies. Oh, I love, um, I love Marianne. She's a great friend. Uh, we stay in touch with each other. She's, she's made a career out of playing horrendous, awful women, <laughs> but she's so lovely in real yeah. life, you know? Yeah, she's, she is formidable, <clears throat> that's for sure. So to kind of wrap this up, I'm curious to know, do you have any favorite roles of your dad's? Because he's done so you know, many great movies. <laughs> in, um, I loved Cocoon. Yeah. And I, Tommy Boy is so much fun. He yeah. did so much heavy stuff. Yeah. Especially in the theater, he did. You know, he's he's he was always doing Eugene O'Neill. I spent comic long days journey tonight as um, death of a salesman. That whenever you got to see him um, do something fun. Right. Uh, it was it was delightful. So Tommy Boy is is very special. But um, I have to say, seeing him on stage in, in Death of a Salesman, I'm so so proud of what he did in that. And he's really, it's it's just the perfect actor for the perfect part at the perfect time. I mean, just all the planets lined up. Uh, he was amazing in that. But there, everybody, he got the Tony Award for Death of a Salesman, and he got the Tony Award for Long Day's Journey at Tonight. And there was one stage show he did in, in Chicago at the Goodman called The Touch of the Poet, which took my breath away and stopped my heart. And I wish that that had moved, and I wish that, um, I wish that people uh, had been able to see that. Yeah, uh, here's my list. I mean, I love First Blood, uh, Blake Edwards 10. I think he was so great in that. Oh, he was so good in that. Uh, FX is a fantastic thriller. Uh, yes, Tommy Boy. My dad took me to see that movie when I was 11, and I've talked to Julie Warner. She has nothing but high praise to say about your dad. Um, I thought he was eerie in, um, when, when he played John Gacy in To Catch a Killer. Um, do you remember yeah, this? Oh, terrifying. Yeah, terrifying. Do you, do you remember this one movie he did? Um, it was a comedy, The Checks in the Mail. I don't, but I'm sure I've seen it, but how long ago was it? 1986. Oh, yeah. 
I'm an old lady. <laughs> who was in it? It was him. Um, let me see who else was in that movie. Um, I'm trying to remember. I have to I have to look it up. But there's there's a part in the movie that I still remember, and I've only seen this movie one time, mind you. There's a there's a part in the movie where um, he goes to get his physical, and the doctor asks him if he um, if he um, you know did the urine test, and he says, "Yep, right here." And then later. It turns out he paid a young guy to pee in a cup for him. And the, the guy says to him, hey, it was the leak I could do for you. <laughs> oh, my God, that's so funny. I don't remember, but, uh, you know, he, there was a period of time in the 80s and 90s where you couldn't turn on the TV without uh, seeing him in a movie. Oh, yeah. He, he did so much. Legal uh, Eagles, uh, bestseller. I love that movie. I think him and James Woods had great chemistry. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a funny story. Mm. James Woods is a famous womanizer, let's right. put it that way, in right. Hollywood. And my father knows my husband. They did plays together. Right. So my husband is named James Lancaster. So in 89 or 90, when uh, I was living in L.A., and I went out to dinner with my dad, and I said, Dad guess who I'm seeing, who I'm dating. And my father looks at me and goes, who? And I said, James Lancaster. And his head hit the table and he said, oh my God, I thought you were going to say James Woods. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Um, Let's see, Ann Archer is in it with him in the check is in the mail. And um, Michael Bowen is in it. Ted Kotcheff was the original director, and I did. I guess he got oh, he fired or quit. First blood. Yeah, they did First Blood and Split what? Image together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And do, do you know if, if your dad got along with Chevy Chase when they made Foul Play? Did you say that again? Did Did your dad get along with Chevy Chase when they made Foul Play? I can't remember, sweetie. Uh, sure he did. I'm, I'm sure he did. Uh, but I, I, I mean, I can't remember, um, you know, yesterday. <laughs> uh, I, I think that, you know, the thing is, is that you had to get along with people or you're not just word spreads and you don't, you don't get asked to work again. So my father would get along with everybody, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't remember him saying anything to the contrary. Yeah. So, you know, they were, I think he got along with Sylvester Stallone and First Blood. He, my dad was a very easy guy to get along with, you know. He was just like, show up, do the job, mm-hmm. um, enjoy the rap party. <laughs> enjoy the rap party? He was the life of the rap party? Exactly. Oh, yeah. Oh, love that. Do, do you have any upcoming uh, uh, projects? Horizon, the, Will, the Kevin Costner movie. Just Horizon. Well, yeah, I mean, just, it's four movies, so I'm in one, two, and four, Mm -hmm. Um, so shot movie one in September in Moab, Utah, and then I'm going to be going back to do movie two and movie four, if I live that long. (laughs) Awesome, awesome. So at the end of the interview, I always tell a joke. Um, What do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate? Oh my God, Um, uh, I have no idea. A liar. <laughs> that is really funny. That's hilarious. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth, you are a national treasure. Thank you so much for coming on today and having oh, all these great anytime. stories. Yes. You have yourself a great day. Be safe out there and continue doing what you do best. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Elizabeth Dennehy, ain't she a sweetheart? Great lady, huh? Great stories. Her father would be very proud. It was a great conversation today, and I'm very blessed. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes.